Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Today, the Planetary Society announced that their light sail 2 spacecraft had successfully demonstrated changing its orbit using nothing more than the power, or rather momentum, of sunlight. LightSail 2 is a tiny 3U CubeSat which was deployed as part of the Falcon Heavy STP launch. And uh, yeah, it deployed its large solar sail last week. The total area of the sail is something about you know, 30 to 40 square meters. Obviously, that's packed up into a very, very small package. And of course, a solar sail works not by catching solar wind, but by reflecting solar photons. And the pressure of light is extremely, extremely low, but if you have a light spacecraft that's only about four kilograms and a large solar sail of about 30 to 40 square meters, then this can develop measurable thrust. The literal downside to this is that because the surface area to volume ratio is so high, it experiences a lot of atmospheric drag. So despite putting it into a very high 720 kilometer orbit, its orbit is actually getting lower, but the success is claimed based upon the fact that it has become more elliptical and therefore it has technically raised its apogee, even although its perigee has fallen down. So the highest point in the orbit is higher, the lower, lowest point on the orbit is lower, but the average height is lower. To do this, the spacecraft has to maintain attitude. It has to orient the sail when it's going in one direction so that it receives the thrust from the sun. And then when it comes around and it doesn't want to experience drag, it rotates the sail to be edge on. The attitude control comes from a single reaction wheel, so it can rotate the spacecraft in a single axis. But it also has a set of magnetorkers, and these provide uh, controls in other axes, but also more importantly, when the reaction wheel starts to get saturated, they are able to desaturate it and make, continue the mission. They have apparently modified the software in the last few days because they were getting too much uh, desaturation time. So they've claimed that this might improve it in performance in coming weeks. And this is an experimental spacecraft after all. Incidentally, some of you might be wondering why an experimental crowdfunded satellite launched on board a, an Air Force mission. And the reason for this was the parent spacecraft in this case was Prox-1. And that was a, an Air Force mission. It's supposed to be a satellite inspector. The idea was that this would demonstrate the capability to co-orbit and autonomously track another satellite and fly around and collect all sorts of information. And to do that, it would carry a CubeSat on board, which it would eject. And then for a week, it would demonstrate these this coordinate flying and these... Uh, your data gathering. But somewhere along the way, it lost this. The project was de-scoped, perhaps because it was too far behind schedule or other plans were afoot. I'm not really clear, but the spacecraft essentially lost its uh, tracking mission. It lost its solar panels. It lost its fancy camera. And it just became an optical target for ground tracking. Uh, so it also was still able to launch LightSail 2, which is nice, but it, the satellite itself doesn't do very much by the looks of things. The Planetary Society has been very lucky to get any mission that would carry the LightSail to its target orbit. Because the LightSail has this big problem with atmospheric drag, it has to launch to a very high orbit. They wanted 800 kilometers. 720 kilometers is what they got because... Prox 1, it was just interested in tracking. It didn't really care what altitude it was going to be at. So they were able to choose a higher orbit as, and then uh, Light Sail 2 was able to benefit from that. Back in 2012, Light Sail was actually selected for launch by NASA as part of their educational launch of nanosatellites program. The problem being that these satellites are all secondary payloads and nothing was going to a high enough orbit. So they ended up not actually flying as part of that program. They did eventually get a launch on board an Atlas V, which was carrying the X-37B, the Air Force's highly secret reusable space plane. But that orbit was nowhere near high enough to actually test the sail's propulsion. What they could do was test that the sail deployed correctly and they could control it from the ground, which provided them useful data for light sail too.
But Light Sail 2 is actually the third attempt at a solar sail by the Planetary Society. In the 1990s, they started developing something called Cosmos 1. They had an opportunity to launch a payload on board a submarine-launched ballistic missile, which had been demilitarized and was available to them to launch a payload into orbit. Unfortunately, the Volna missile failed after 82 seconds, and so therefore the mission never made it to space. The first solar sail mission to successfully launch to space was Icarus, the interplanetary kite craft accelerated by radiation off the sun. That was launched in May 2010. It was developed by the Japanese space agency JAXA, and it was part of a larger mission to fly past Venus. It actually had instruments on board to measure things like gamma ray polarization. So that flew, it demonstrated thrust, but because the spacecraft was quite heavy compared to the size of the sail, it wasn't a huge amount of thrust. It was just enough to demonstrate the concept worked. And yeah, I mean, you should put this in numbers. The thrust you get from a solar sail at the distance of the Earth's orbit is about 8 micronewtons per square meter. So under perfect conditions, the 32 square meter sail on Light Sail 2 develops about a quarter of a millinewton of thrust. And when you consider that it has its mass of 4 kilograms, the acceleration is about 62 micrometers per second per second. And that may seem small, but after a minute's acceleration, that spacecraft is able to exceed the average speed of a garden snail. Anyway, another spacecraft that's kind of important in the development of light sail is the NanoSail D, which was originally developed by Ames and Marshall Space Flight Center. And in 20 2008, it was scheduled to be one of the payloads on the third launch of Falcon 1, which, as we know, failed. They did still have a backup, the NanoSail D2, and that did launch successfully into space on board a Minotaur 4 from the Kodiak launch facility in Alaska. This was a secondary payload to the FastSat, the Fast Affordable Scientific and Technology Satellite, but they had an interesting problem deploying it. They sent the signal to activate the deployment, the door opened, but the spacecraft never deployed and they tried to troubleshoot it. They didn't have any problems. Then six weeks later, it deployed spontaneously and they only noticed this because the telemetry showed the change in the velocity. But again, this was a relatively low orbit, so the atmospheric drag completely dominated the radiation thrust and it decayed after a couple of months. And every now and then, proposals turn up to send spacecraft to various destinations using the power of a solar sail. Uh, there was actually a plan to go to Halley's Comet, and I'm not just talking about a fly pass, but a rendezvous. That was actually going to be the US's principal mission to Halley's Comet. And when it get axed because of you know concerns about deficit spending, the US was the only country that didn't really have a spacecraft that was pr you know intended to go to Halley's Comet. They had to repurpose another one. The US has actually used Sun for attitude control in a few missions. Mariner 4 actually included solar vanes they were experimenting with so they could adjust the attitude of the spacecraft. Mariner 10 ran out of its uh, you know, reaction control thrusters to control its attitude and they angled the solar panels in such a way that it spun up the spacecraft over time and therefore made it stable. And Kepler, of course, the exoplanet hunting mission that found so many objects, after it was reduced to two working gyroscopes, it was placed in an attitude where solar radiation pressure would keep the spacecraft stabilized in the roll axis, and therefore they were able to get a second set of data out of the spacecraft. So anyway, look, congratulations are in order for the Planetary Society for demonstrating that you can, in fact, use a solar sail in relatively low orbit, certainly not in deep space. It's always great to see a crowdfunded project achieve its goals and get deployed. And yeah, they're, they're going to be testing this, so that's great. It would be nice in the future to see if the technology can actually be used, say, for exploring asteroids or other uh, you know, celestial bodies in the solar system. But right now, just a demonstration that they can make something so small work in low Earth orbit is fantastic. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Thank <laughs> you.